name is Adam Sobel, and I work here at Columbia at the Department of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics, which is in the Engineering School, and at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. I'm an atmospheric scientist and study the physics of climate and weather on time scales of days to decades, more or less. Most of my work has been on basic physics of how the atmosphere works, especially in the tropics. Questions like why does it rain in certain places at times and not others? How different kinds of weather systems work? Uh, including hurricanes. For a number of years, we've been studying hurricanes. In recent years, um, the work on hurricanes and on other types of extreme events, including tornadoes, hail, and heavy rain events, has become a bigger and bigger part of my work. And the work has also gained an applied dimension in the last few years. This ha happened to me really after Hurricane Sandy and Irene, to some extent, but especially Sandy, which, um, living here in New York and as a scientist, um, who worked on hurricanes, suddenly being in the media a lot after those events, uh, really got me very aware of how deep and important the public interest is in the work that we do on extreme events and how big the questions are. So specifically, right now, um, with several of my colleagues, especially Cha Ying Li, uh, Michael Tippett, and Susanna Camargo, we're working on developing a tropical cyclone risk model, which is especially designed to estimate the risk of rare but high-impact tropical cyclones. This problem of estimating uh, high-impact but low-probability events is something that the insurance industry has been dealing with for several decades, and they have so-called catastrophe models which do this, which generate large sets of synthetic events to estimate those probabilities of rare events. What we're doing is similar but has several differences from what's done in industry. The first is that our models are made up of science that's fully peer-reviewed and open source, which in private industry can't be done because of reasons of competitive advantage and intellectual property constraints. The second is that uh, we account for climate change, which the insurance industry doesn't do yet because they don't think out that far uh, to the future because their contracts are written one year at a time. The third thing is that the insurance industry is only concerned with risks where they have an investment, so U.S. coastal hurricanes or California earthquakes, for example, but they're not much interested in any disaster happening in the developing world where there isn't much insured uh, assets anymore. If we really want to be more effective in preventing disasters, we have to learn to understand what the risks are before the events happen, and not only understand them, but act on them. We have to be able to realize that we're at risk even before the event happens so that we can take actions or plan or learn how to do better emergency management, not just after, but before the events. And that requires doing predictive science, being able to justify how good it is, what it can tell us and what it can't tell us, and being willing to act on it. We face the same issue when we think on the larger scale about human-induced climate change, as we do with extreme events. That's a case where the science is telling us that there's risks going forward, that we face dangers, and that we should do things based on them now rather than later. But just as with the risk of rare extreme events, it's difficult for people to focus on that risk because it seems far off in the future, there's more immediate concerns. But that's the challenge we face as a species now, is to act on that scientific information sooner rather than later. I grew up here in New York City, and I got interested in science first as a small child when my father took me to the American Museum of Natural History, and especially the planetarium there, where I was fascinated by the stars and the planets. When I was in high school, I became interested in music, and I played jazz trumpet, and I played electric bass in a rock band. And then when I went to college, I was a double major in physics and music. And when I got out of college, I actually wanted to be a musician. And I tried that for a couple of years. It wasn't working out so well. And I thought I'd go back to science, but I realized, having been out in the world a few years at that point, that I ought to think about exactly what I was going to do. And if I was going to study physics, which was my inclination, what kind of physics I would do, because it, affect, it would affect what kind of job I could get. And my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, uh, was a passionate environmentalist. And she said to me, um, Adam, if I had your physics background, I would study meteorology and do global warming. And I thought that was pretty boring the first time she said it to me. But as I started to learn about the field of meteorology, I became fascinated by it. First of all, because I'd always found fluid flows fascinating, the motion of the air and water. That was a beautiful topic to me. And I liked the idea of, of simulating worlds on the computer. And I liked the fact that the science was directly relevant to human life. But even now, a lot of my work isn't about climate change, but it's just understanding processes in the atmosphere, the probabilities of rare events. But climate change is the 
is the big elephant in the room that's driving so much of our, our thinking now about how our science is relevant to society.